On January 6, 1853, a bitterly cold day in New England, a steam train pulling a single passenger car left the Andover, Massachusetts station bound for Concord, New Hampshire. There were several passengers in the car, among them the president-elect of the United States, Franklin Pierce, his wife Jane, and their 11-year-old son, Benny. The Pierces were returning from seeing friends in Amherst over the holidays. We're not sure exactly what happened to the train, but some kind of accident caused it to derail. The passenger car tumbled down an embankment and landed on its roof. It happened pretty much right here, on this stretch of track, though the terrain has undoubtedly changed since 1853. The president-elect and his wife weren't badly hurt, but as the train crashed, a piece of metal struck Benny in the forehead. It literally sheared off the back of his skull. There was nothing Pierce or his wife could do. They watched their son die right in front of them. The only saving grace was that he was killed instantly and didn't suffer. Benny was their last surviving child. The Pierces had a baby boy who died shortly after birth. Their second son died of typhus at the age of four in 1843. Almost all parents in the 19th century suffered the deaths of children, but the Pierces had suffered more than their share, and this one is particularly horrible. It was two days short of two months before Pierce was set to be inaugurated as the 14th president of the United States. Jane was overcome with grief at Benny's death and did not accompany her husband to Washington at first. In fact, the inaugural ball and other festivities traditional upon the installation of a new president were canceled out of respect for Pierce's personal grief. Pierce even made a brief reference to his family tragedy in the first sentence of his inaugural address. Pierce was escorted to the White House by the outgoing president, Millard Fillmore, and then he, Pierce, spent the day greeting visitors and well-wishers. The crowd trashed the place, tracking mud onto the carpets and leaving dirty dishes everywhere. The White House servants were gone and the house had not yet been made ready for the new first family. When the reception ended, Pierce and his private secretary, Sidney Webster, made their way upstairs by candlelight. They crashed in whatever beds they found were made up. This was the inauspicious beginning of Franklin Pierce's administration. I chose to begin this video, an in-depth look at the very sad life and disastrous presidency of Franklin Pierce with these stories, because I think they really bring home the tragedy, failure, and bad luck that has shadowed Pierce all throughout American history. I'm gonna go back and talk about Pierce, his background, how he came to be president, and of course, what happened during his single term, but to get a real sense of how this story goes, you need to know these tragic and unusual circumstances under which his presidency began. Hi, I'm Sean Munger, and welcome to another Deep Dive History video. You may wonder, given my track record, I've done videos on historical analyses of popular movies, lots of nautical and ship-related topics, a recent one on the Iran-Contra scandal, you may wonder why I'm doing this, an in-depth biography of one of the worst and most forgettable presidents of the United States, Franklin Pierce. Whenever historians rank U.S. presidents, a game I have no interest in playing, quite frankly, Pierce usually winds up within about two rungs of the bottom. He served one term from 1853 to 1857, was not re-elected or even re-nominated by his own party, and quickly sank into obscurity. He is usually blamed, not unfairly, for exacerbating a lot of the problems that brought on the Civil War, only four years after he left office. Pierce is less a personality in history than he is a trivial pursuit question. I am incredibly fascinated by Franklin Pierce, why he was such a failure, and what his failure as president can tell us about the times he lived in. I think we can learn a lot more about the presidency from the stories of the men who've done it badly than we can from the guys who were really good at it, your Lincolns, Washingtons, FDRs, etc. And I think you might find it an interesting story, because unless you happen to know a lot about Franklin Pierce already, which is pretty unlikely, you're not going to know what happens next in this story. There's also a human angle, a personal angle to the story that's absolutely devastating. I think it's hard to find any U.S. president who had a sadder life than Franklin Pierce. In addition to being the saddest president, while it's hard to quantify these things, I think he also qualifies as one of our drunkest, even surpassing champion drinkers 
like Ulysses Grant and Pierce's own successor, James Buchanan. Now, this is not to make light of alcoholism, which is a serious disease and generally not the fault of the person who suffers from it. Indeed, when we're done, you may have quite a lot of sympathy for why Pierce turned to the bottle. The subject of alcohol in 19th century America is itself pretty interesting, and you have to admit that Pierce has a lot to contribute to that history. There is very little material on Franklin Pierce available on YouTube. If you do a search for his name, you'll bring up considerably more videos of sporting events at schools named after Franklin Pierce than you will videos about the man himself. So clearly there is a need for this. Mine is, I believe, the longest and most in-depth examination of Pierce on YouTube, at least the longest that's not just a recording of a lecture or a PBS documentary or something. The one exception might be Peter Ray's series on him from a couple of years ago. Almost all the material about Franklin Pierce on YouTube is short capsule summary type of stuff. And almost all of that exists for the sake of completeness, meaning videos specifically about Pierce are done because the content creator does a lot of stuff on U.S. presidents generally, and Pierce is simply on the list. Mr. Beat, I'm looking at you. So if you're looking for a reason to spend a considerable amount of time watching this video, this is it. You're not going to get it anywhere else. I am not looking to rehabilitate Pierce's historical reputation, as some historians who've studied him have attempted to. Yes, I see you there, Peter Wallner. I think Pierce was an awful, awful president who probably never should have been elected. But he was, and despite his failings, I think his story is pretty poignant. I also confess I have a personal interest in Franklin Pierce. Years ago, I wrote a short story that involved him as a character. That story is publicly available. And if you're still interested, at the end of this video, I'll tell you where you can get it for free. This is a very long video, and I don't expect people to watch it all the way through in one chunk, though if you do, more power to you. What I suggest you do is bookmark it and then work your way through it chapter by chapter. Do pay attention to the chapters, I've organized them by subject, and they're clearly marked in the description. So if you're ready to delve into the tragic, frustrating, alcohol-sodden life of Franklin Pierce, let's get to it. First, we have to understand the country and the world that he was born into, because it explains a lot about who he eventually became. We're going to be visiting many places in the course of this journey, and I think we have to start many years before the birth of Franklin Pierce in this place. This is Boston, specifically the monument on the site of the Battle of Bunker Hill, which took place on June 17, 1775. This was one of the opening battles of the American Revolutionary War. The shooting between colonials and the British had begun two months earlier, on April 19th, in Lexington. On that day, or shortly after it, someone came out into a field in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, to tell a young farmer, Benjamin Pierce, only 17 at the time, that the war had begun. Legend has it that Pierce immediately dropped what he was doing and walked off the farm to join up. Whether this specific story is true or not, Pierce did serve and he did fight here at Bunker Hill. Benjamin Pierce also fought here at Saratoga, one of the pivotal battles of the war, in the fall of 1777, and he endured the terrible conditions at Valley Forge, where Washington's army was camped and desperately short on supplies the following winter. Basically, if you wanted an unimpeachable origin story for a dyed-in-the-wool American patriot, these are exactly the kind of credentials that you would want. What this sort of origin story did for Benjamin Pierce and the family that he began soon after the war was to position them as the political elite in the new United States. He was unimpeachably part of the revolutionary generation. Generations are very important to Franklin Pierce's story. After American independence was won from Britain, Pierce settled in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, that's where we are now, by the way, and eventually built this house in 1804, the year of Franklin's birth. By that time, Benjamin had several, several political positions in New Hampshire, and in fact was on the governor's council of that, at that time. Franklin was his sixth child, 
Because this house hadn't quite been built yet at the time he was born, he was actually born in a log cabin that stood out back of where this house was located. He was born in November 1804, the same month that Thomas Jefferson was re-elected as President of the United States. I'm going to talk about the politics of this era in a minute. That's important, too. Franklin's revered older brother was Benjamin Kendrick Pierce. He was 14 at the time Franklin was born. Not bad looking, eh? You might make a comparison to a young Robert Downey Jr. Yes, Franklin Pierce was the younger brother of Iron Man. Good looks run in the Pierce family, by the way. As you can plainly see, Brother Ben was a military officer. He joined the army just before the War of 1812 and was in several major battles. Franklin grew up hearing stories of his brother's heroism in the War of 1812. Uh, yes, he had another older brother, John Sullivan Pierce, who also served in that war. Probably a name mentioned in these stories was Winfield Scott, a young military officer who rose high in the ranks during the war and who commanded... American forces at the Battle of Lundy's Lane in July 1814, a battle in which Benjamin Pierce participated. Scott would eventually be the presidential candidate whom Franklin Pierce would defeat in 1852. I just can't resist mentioning that the Battle of Lundy's Lane is talked about obliquely in one of my all-time favorite movies, Martin Scorsese's criminally underrated 19th century gangster drama, Gangs of New York from 2002. Anyway, that's an aside. Back to Franklin Pierce. In 1820, when he had not yet turned 16, Franklin Pierce went off to Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. This was a tiny, tiny school in 1820, but very prestigious. This is Bowdoin College, by the way. Very quintessentially New England, ivy-covered wall type of place. Pierce met a number of important people at Bowdoin College and people with whom Pierce's life would intersect directly or indirectly. For example, poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was in the class behind Pierce. In that same class was Calvin Ellis Stowe, who would go on to teach at Bowdoin College. Stowe would eventually marry Harriet Beecher, who in 1852 would write the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin about slavery and which would cause President Pierce some grief. Pierce reportedly copied test answers from Stowe. Pierce also befriended Jonathan Silly, that's C-I-L-L-E-Y, who would eventually get elected to Congress from the state of Maine. The most important friend that Pierce met at Bowdoin, though, was Nathaniel Hawthorne. The eventual author of The Scarlet Letter and The House of Seven Gables was a year behind Pierce, but the two basically became best friends. You'll see Hawthorne pop up again later in our story. For all the academic star power assembled at Bowdoin College, Pierce was an utterly abysmal student, at least at first. He vastly preferred fishing and hiking to studying, and was literally last in his class by the end of his sophomore year. He and his friends also had a habit of sneaking out of their dorm and going to a nearby tavern, where they got utterly bombed on numerous occasions. This is the first appearance of alcohol in Franklin Pierce's life story, and it's worth a few words. Some historians, like Michael Holt, author of an important source for this video, stop short of labeling Pierce an alcoholic, arguing that, quote, it is impossible to render a definitive diagnosis while admitting that there is considerable evidence for it. I'm not so gun-shy. Pierce was an alcoholic. His heavy drinking is well documented throughout his life, especially toward the end of it. I think it's safe to label Pierce an alcoholic in part because, in general, Americans drank vastly greater amounts of alcohol in the early 19th century than they do today. Historians estimate that the average American consumed about 7.1 gallons of alcohol yearly in 1830, less than a third of Americans' average intake in the early 21st century. 7.1 gallons, that is a staggering amount of booze. So anyone who gained a reputation as an alcoholic in the early 19th century means they were imbibing amounts that would be absolutely off the charts by modern standards. So yes, Franklin Pierce was an alcoholic. I don't think there's any question of it. Those marks at the end of sophomore year evidently scared him straight. By that I mean he certainly didn't quit drinking, 
but Pierce did double down to improve his academic performance. Instead of copying test answers from Harriet Beecher Stowe's future husband, Pierce started getting up at 4 a.m. every morning to study. It worked. In 1824, Franklin Pierce graduated fifth in his class of 14. After living at home for a little while after graduation, Pierce went to live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1825, where he read law with a man named Levi Woodbury, future Supreme Court Justice. I just used a phrase there, reading law, that might be unfamiliar to you. The way somebody became a lawyer in early 19th century America is considerably different than the way it works today. You didn't go to law school, graduate, and then take the bar exam, which is what I did in the 1990s. There were no law schools in America in 1825. Law was a profession that was learned by apprenticeship, kind of like learning to become a shoemaker or a blacksmith. A promising young student would work in the office of a hometown lawyer who would teach him the law and how to read cases and things like that, and then also use that apprentice as cheap labor in their own practice. Almost all the early U.S. presidents were lawyers who were trained more or less in this manner. If you weren't a merchant or a business owner, being a lawyer, especially in a small New England town, was one of the surest ways to prosperity in this time. It was also a pipeline into politics, especially in a family like Pierce's. Levi Woodbury was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1825, shortly after Pierce got there, so he had to find a new mentor. He went to Amherst and read law with another attorney. While he was reading law in Amherst, Franklin made the acquaintance of a young lady, Jane Means Appleton, two years younger. They don't appear to have started dating at this time. They called it courting in the 19th century. That would come later. Franklin Pierce was admitted to the bar in Hillsborough County, New Hampshire, in 1827. That was the same year that his father, Benjamin Sr., was elected governor of New Hampshire. He was a strong Democratic Republican, yes, that's the name of the party, and his son Franklin was too. So, here's what's going on with the parties. Between the time of the rise of political parties in America in the 1790s, and the time Andrew Jackson began shaking up the political scene some 30 years later, there were two major political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Federalists were generally the party of merchants, banks, and moneyed interests. Democratic Republicans claimed to champion small farmers and the common man, though most of its prominent politicians, like Thomas Jefferson himself, were aristocratic Southern planters. The Federalist Party faded in the later 18-teens and 1820s, especially at the national level, though some Federalists could still be found in New England. The real competition was now within the Democratic-Republican Party, and that competition broke into the open in the 1824 election season. Though they were both nominally Democratic-Republicans, John Quincy Adams faced off against war hero and wannabe genocidal maniac Andrew Jackson. Adams, whose father was Federalist President John Adams, was thought to favor northern commercial interests and especially federal spending on internal improvements, turnpikes, canals, and stuff like that. Jackson was a Tennessee slave owner, representing the West, which in the 1820s could still be defined as including Tennessee. Banks and money issues were very important in this period, as well as uh, the procedure of allowing the state to license limited liability business organizations, corporations. Jackson was very opposed to that kind of thing. The 1824 election yielded no candidate with a majority, so it went to the House of Representatives, which chose Adams, who had lost the popular vote and was even behind Jackson in electoral votes. This, the selection of Adams as president, enraged supporters of Jackson, who crystallized even more firmly in favor of his principles and in opposition to Adams. The Pierce family fell into the Jackson camp. Benjamin Pierce had a smooth and untroubled sailing to election as New Hampshire governor in 1827. But in 1828, when he had to run for re-election, New Hampshire had one-year terms for the governorship at this time, a bunch of pro-Adams men organized to block him. They did, but New Hampshire had become a battleground between these rival factions of Democratic Republicans. 
In 1828, the much-awaited rematch between Adams and Jackson got going. Adam, Andrew Jackson won handily. J.Q. Adams didn't have much of a chance. Benjamin Pierce was returned to office as New Hampshire governor in 1828. And Franklin, who organized campaign meetings for his father, was now firmly entrenched among the pro-Jackson forces. In 1829, Jackson's first year as president, Franklin Pierce was elected to the New Hampshire state legislature. Andrew Jackson changed American politics, and Pierce, already a privileged son of New Hampshire, was certainly there for it. I'm going to put Franklin Pierce aside for a moment and talk about some broader trends in American history around this time. I told you in the last chapter that generations are important to this story. Now, this chapter may seem like a digression, but there's a method to my madness, I assure you. To get the point that I'm going to be making about the transition of generations, we have to crunch some data. This graph indicates the birth dates and lifespans of various presidents, plotted against important events and eras in American history. Here, in the middle decades of the 18th century, are the birth dates of most of the Amer major American revolutionaries, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, etc. The American Revolution was somewhat unique among world revolutions in that most of its major leaders were fairly young when it occurred. This is in contrast, marked contrast, to other world revolutions. China's, Russia's, and Iran's, for example, which were led by revolutionary elites who often worked for decades to bring about revolution in their countries and who usually succeeded only toward the end of their lives. A good example would be Mao Zedong, who was 56 when he finally completed the communist revolution in mainland China in 1949, or Ayatollah Khomeini, who was 77 when his Islamic revolution overthrew the Shah of Iran in 1978. By contrast, Jefferson was only 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh-oh, look what I did just there. I tend to get hate mail from angry viewers whenever I compare the American Revolution to other world revolutions. Well, suck it up, buttercup. They are comparable. America is not exceptional in this regard, so just deal with it. Anyway, back to the timeline. What ages revolutionary leaders were at the time of their revolution affects how long they and their generation can remain in charge of a new society afterwards. You can see this plainly here. Jefferson, 33 at the time of the American Revolution, was 57 when he became president in 1801. Madison was younger, born in 1751, and he was 58 when he became president in 1809. Each succeeding leader, a little younger than the previous one, could push out the edge of the envelope, where the revolutionary generation was still in power. James Monroe, the fifth president, joined the Continental Army as a teenager. He was born in 1758, and he was 59 when he became president in 1817. But as time marches farther on into the 19th century, the revolution generation is starting to get long in the tooth. By 1825, when Monroe is leaving office, Washington is long dead, Jefferson and the first Adams are literally on their deathbeds, and now it's been 50 years since the revolution began, so military or political veterans of that era are getting hard to find. That brings us to John Quincy Adams, yes, spelled Q-U-I-N-C-Y, but pronounced Quincy, and his successor, Andrew Jackson. Both were born in 1767, and both had very strained and somewhat tenuous claims to be part of the American Revolution generation. In Quincy's case, he was the son of one of the most important revolutionaries, John Adams. And although he didn't personally fight in the Revolution, he was too young, he was at his father's side throughout that era, and thus had at least witnessed many revolutionary events. For example, he was an eyewitness to the Battle of Bunker Hill, at which Franklin Pierce's father fought. You could, with a stretch, call him part of the revolutionary generation, just barely. Then came Andrew Jackson. He was a veteran of the Revolutionary War, but he was only 13 when he joined the Continental Army in 1780, toward the very end of the conflict. In 
A year later, Jackson and his brother were taken prisoner by a British unit. Andrew had his hand slashed by a sword when he refused to clean a British officer's boots. The revolution ended when he was 16, but again, he could claim to be revolutionary generation, just under the wire. Jackson wound up serving two terms as president. Far from his public image as a tough, backwoods Indian fighter, he was actually a tiny, old, frail man during his time in the White House. Skeletally thin, he had white hair, much of the time he couldn't walk. He was unquestionably going to be the last of the revolution generation to serve as president. America was now forced by demographics and the march of time to transition political power to a succeeding generation, whether they liked it or not. This sort of transition is always chaotic in revolutionary societies. The Soviet Union, for example, did not survive its transition to the first generation of leaders born after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. The first Soviet-born leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, born in 1931, was its last leader. China didn't affect its revolutionary transition until 2002, when Hu Jintao became leader of the Chinese Communist Party. Iran still hasn't gone through its revolutionary transition. Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran today, is still part of the generation that fomented Iran's Islamic Revolution 45 years ago. But they're going to have to do it soon. Khamenei is in his 80s. So where am I going with all of this? Well, because of Andrew Jackson's age and declining health, and the tradition set by Washington that presidents did not serve more than two terms, the year 1836 was destined to be a sea change in American politics and society. To whom was leadership of the American Republic going to devolve? Who would be the first post-revolution generation leader, and what tone was that going to set going forward? The answer, I'm sorry to say, is Martin Van Buren. He was Jackson's second vice president, elected in his own right in 1836, and the first American president born after the Declaration of Independence. He was born in 1782. Van Buren was arguably the first party politician to be elected president. Not that previous presidents were not politicians. Clearly, they were. But Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe were all deeply involved in the project of building the new American nation for most of their adult lives. Quincy Adams was tangentially connected to that project. Jackson was a military leader, but Van Buren was the first career politician. And look at the presidents who came after him up until the Civil War. Of the ones who were not military leaders, William Henry Harrison and Zachary Taylor, uh, all of them, including Franklin Pierce, were also career politicians. Tyler, Polk, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan. Essentially, once the revolutionary generation died off, power and leadership in America fell into the hands not of statesmen or nation builders, but a generation of professional politicians, party hacks. And however many glowing stories there were in their backgrounds of Revolutionary War battles or great, American, great moments in early American history, the formative years of these men, like Franklin Pierce, were markedly different than the generation that had come before them. This transition of power from one generation to the next occurred just as Franklin Pierce was starting to enter national politics. Pierce, who served in the New Hampshire State House, was elected to the Federal House of Representatives in 1832, the same election in which Andrew Jackson was overwhelmingly re-elected to the presidency, with Van Buren as his vice president, replacing John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who resigned to seek election to the Senate, and who looked uncannily like Dr. Emmett Brown, played by Christopher Lloyd in the Back to the Future films. In 1836, when Martin Van Buren easily won election against the new opposition party called the Whigs, Pierce was elected senator from New Hampshire. Senators at this time were elected by state legislatures, not directly by voters. Pierce was 32, the youngest man elected to the U.S. Senate in history up until that time. After 1836, when the transition out of the revolutionary generation was complete, Pierce was well-positioned to be in the new up-and-coming leadership class. 
But amidst all this generational change, there was a time bomb, a poison pill, lurking at the heart of the American Republic, and that was slavery. This was the issue that the revolutionary generation ducked, first by refusing to consider seriously the notion of abolishing slavery in America at the outset in 1776, and then they ducked it again, even worse this time, by agreeing to the toxic compromises in the Constitution of 1787. Indeed, the Constitution directly protected slavery, with the Three-Fifths Compromise and the prohibition on Congress interfering with the Atlantic slave trade until 1808. I am in a minority of American historians who believe that slavery could have been abolished during the Revolution, either at the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution level, without tearing the country apart. I'll go to my grave probably believing that the framers could have done it, if only they actually had the qualities that generations of American exceptionalist mythology has imbued them with, wisdom and foresight. Now you can argue about that in the comments to this video if you want. I've got more important things to do than to pay attention to that argument, but I do believe that, and I think the historical evidence supports it. Now before you denounce me as a heretic, you might want to read this book, Race and Revolution, by the late Gary Nash, which I believe uh, proves this thesis, or at least supports it. Now, that's an argument for another time, but it's unquestionable that the issue of slavery and its immorality cast a deadly shadow over the new American Republic, and the revolutionary generation refused to solve it, however compelling they might have found their reasons for refusing. If the statesmen and nation builders of the revolution generation, the people born at this end of the timeline, if they fell down on the task of resolving the monstrous problem of slavery, can you really expect that the next generation, the career politicians and party hacks, do you really think they're going to do any better at it? I'm framing the question that way, even though it's provocative, because I think it makes Franklin Pierce's ineptitude at dealing with slavery much easier to understand. Now, let's get back specifically to the story of Franklin Pierce, but I do think that this discussion of the generational dynamics of the early American Republic is absolutely critical to understanding him and his legacy. Back to the wormhole. This nice-looking Georgian-style house is called the Colonel Robert Means House, and it faces the village green of Amherst, New Hampshire. See, there's the green. And the street it's on is today called Pierce Lane. Let's go back to the house. We're here because in this house, on November 19th, 1834, a wedding ceremony took place. Franklin Pierce, our erstwhile hero, married Jane Means Appleton. He was then a congressman. She was 28, two years younger than him. The Colonel Robert Means House, built originally in 1785, was the home of Jane's grandmother. There was a brief reception, by brief I mean like an hour, and then the carriages rattled away from the front of this house, carrying the newlywed Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Pierce on the first leg of their journey to Washington, D.C. The marriage of Franklin and Jane is proof positive that opposites attract. He was outgoing and gregarious, she was an extreme introvert. Pierce wasn't that interested in God and religion. Jane was very devout. He loved shaking hands and meeting people. He was a career politician, for God's sake. Jane kept to herself. Franklin guzzled gallons of booze. Jane was a teetotaler. In fact, him quitting the bottle may have been a condition of their marriage. For the first few months they were married, he didn't touch alcohol, one of the many attempts at drying out in Pierce's life that ultimately didn't work. On New Year's Day, 1835, Jane Pierce was at the White House at a reception organized by President Andrew Jackson. She met her husband's political hero. From the get-go, Jane detested politics and chafed at the social responsibilities of a congressman's wife. In fact, after, after a couple of months, she left Washington entirely and went back to Amherst to live with her mother. Oh, one more thing. Jane's family, which was very prominent in Amherst society, leaned strongly Whig. The parties had reconstituted themselves by now. The old Democratic-Republican Party could not survive the split between Jackson's guys and Quincy Adams's guys, 
So Jackson ran with Democrats, and the opposition, well, they ultimately became Whigs. Jane Appleton's staunch Whig family did not approve of her marrying a Jacksonian Democrat, and apparently they tried to talk her out of it. An important thing to keep in mind here is that both parties, Whigs and Democrats, had pro-slavery and anti-slavery wings. It wasn't that one party tended to sympathize with slaveholders and the other party didn't. That came later. But a new, very polarizing factor was starting to rise in the early 1830s. It was exemplified by this man, Boston newspaper publisher William Lloyd Garrison, who founded the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society on New Year's Day, 1831. Now, there had been plenty of opposition to slavery before in America, but the abolitionist movement that took the country by storm in the early 1830s was something new. They didn't use economic arguments against slavery or the old chestnut that slavery was wrong because it degraded white people. No, Garrison and his crowd attacked slavery as a moral abomination, an evil that must be swept away by the hand of God. Abolitionist organizations tended to include African Americans and especially women, and their goals were not limited to merely to abolitionist slavery. Many prominent abolitionists championed gender equality, especially women's suffrage. The anti-slavery movement and the women's rights movement of this period could not be disentangled from each other. One of the things that abolitionist groups like Garrison's did was to absolutely flood legislatures, both state at the state and national level, with petitions demanding the outlawing of slavery, or at least limitations on it, such as abolishing it in the District of Columbia, or modifying rules on the return of fugitive slaves, that sort of thing. Eventually, over 100,000 of these petitions reached Congress. The idea was to make so much noise politically as possible. It worked. Franklin Pierce utterly hated abolitionists. He was very much like other American politicians of this era who thought that abolitionists were dangerous radicals who were ruining everything for their radical position of believing that slavery was wrong. The reason was that the Constitution and the Union were built on compromises over slavery, and abolitionists basically dropped trow and crapped on the very idea of compromise, at least where slavery was concerned. If abolitionist sentiment increased, it would be harder and harder to make political compromises, and that would threaten the stability of the Union. That was how Pierce and many politicians of the 1830s saw it. This was why they were hostile to abolitionism, regardless of what their personal feelings were on slavery. Let's go to another location. Wormhole, please. Wormhole, please. Thank you. This is Statutory Hall in the Capitol in Washington, D.C., a ceremonial chamber where statues of famous people, two sent by each state, are put on display on a rotating basis. That's what it is now. But before 1857, when the Capitol was remodeled, this was where the U.S. House of Representatives met in session. Some big things in Pierce's career happened here, which is why we're here. In December 1835, just after the start of the term to which Franklin was re-elected in the fall of 1834, a South Carolina congressman, James Hammond, spoke on the problem of those pesky mountains of petitions that were beginning to choke the channels of legitimate legislative business in the House. He suggested that Congress refuse even to receive any petitions from abolitionists at all. Pierce gave a speech in rebuttal. He said, no, that was going too far. The people did have the constitutional right to petition Congress. But instead of refusing to receive the petitions, Pierce suggested a rule that would automatically table them, which meant they would never come up for debate and no action would ever be taken on them which is functionally the same thing as Hammond demanded, but dressed up a little differently. A House committee pondered the question. Pierce was appointed to this committee, and what emerged was, and what was passed in 1836 was called Rule 21, or the Gag Rule. It did exactly what Pierce suggested, automatically tabled any and all anti-slavery business in the House of Representatives. The Gag Rule proved extremely controversial in Congress, 
a faction of congressmen, including former President John Quincy Adams, who was serving in the House, worked for eight years to abolish it. In 1844, thanks to Quincy Adams' deft work, they finally succeeded. But in the late 1830s and early 1840s, Congress was forbidden by its internal rules to even talk about slavery, thanks in part to Franklin Pierce. While the gag rule drama was going on, in February 1836, Pierce received two letters from Jane in New Hampshire. One announced the birth of his son, whom they named Franklin Jr. The other, dated three days later, reported that the baby had died. This was the first of the searing tragedies that would mark the Pierce family. As we've seen, Martin Van Buren won election in 1836 as Jackson's successor. Shortly after that, in December, the New Hampshire state legislature voted Frank to promote Congressman Franklin Pierce to the U.S. Senate. He was only 32, one of the youngest senators ever to serve up until that time. Things did not go well for President Martin Van Buren. Almost as soon as he took the oath of office, the economy collapsed in the Panic of 1837, which was caused mostly by previous President Andrew Jackson's short-sighted monetary policies. Then there was the whole trail of tears thing, which we don't need to get into. On February 24th, 1838, Pierce's college friend Jonathan Silly, who was now a congressman from Maine, fought a duel with another congressman, William Graves. The insult that set it off was indirectly tied to political passions over Congress's response to the Panic of 1837. Pierce tried to stop the duel, but he couldn't. Graves and Silly faced off with rifles at 80 yards. Silly, uh, Graves blew a hole in Silly's thigh, and he bled to death in a few minutes. Pierce was crushed with guilt. The incident made Jane even more hostile to her husband's profession of politics. This was not a good time. In the spring of 1839, Jane was pregnant again. Pierce's father, Benjamin, died on April 1st of that year. On August 27th, Jane gave birth to another boy whom they called Frank Robert. She was supposed to return with her husband to Washington at the start of the next congressional term, but caring for the baby gave her a convenient excuse to stay home in Concord, where they had moved from Hillsborough in the summer of 1838. She never again joined her husband in Washington while he was in Congress. The Jackson Democrats' political reverses during hapless Martin Van Buren's term yielded a political earthquake in 1840. The Whigs, the opposition party, were now well organized, and they reran their 1836 candidate, William Henry Harrison, veteran Indian fighter and one-time protege of Thomas Jefferson. The Whigs ran a disingenuous campaign, which painted Harrison as a common man of the people who had been born supposedly in a log cabin, completely false. He was actually born in a slave-built mansion in Virginia. They pilloried Martin Van Buren as Martin Van Ruin, playing up his economic failures. Harrison wiped the floor with Van Buren in the election. Now in the political minority, being in the Senate wasn't much fun for Franklin Pierce anymore, even after Harrison conveniently died after one month on the job. Pierce's wife was back in New Hampshire, one of his best friends was dead, his youngest son was pushing up daisies, and he was battling drinking again. In April 1841, the clouds lifted a bit when Jane gave birth to their third child, Benjamin, Benny. But Pierce decided that he was going to quit the Senate and the bottle. In the fall of 1841, Pierce announced his intention to resign his Senate seat in a few months' time, and he also pledged to stop drinking, the temperance pledge it was called at that time. If he was back home with Jane, he thought it was more likely that he'd actually be able to stick to it. In February 1842, Pierce returned to Concord, New Hampshire. He was now out of office, but not entirely out of politics. He was basically the Democratic Party boss of the state of New Hampshire. He returned to his law practice, which proved lucrative, and he enjoyed being a kingmaker in New Hampshire politics. Then, conveniently, something happened that would prove an opportunity to become something that many mid-19th century politicians found helpful, if not indispensable, a war hero. <laughs> 
This rather nondescript highway in San Benito, Texas, is built on top of a battlefield. They do mark it, see, there's a cannon there, and some marker stones, and holy crap, get out of the way! Anyway, on April 25th, 1846, American and Mexican army forces clashed here after playing cat and mouse all over the border between Texas and Mexico. This was called the Thornton Affair. All you need to know about it is that Congress and President James K. Polk used it as a reason for the United States to declare war on Mexico on May 13th, 1846. If I can get the wormhole back, I'll take you up to Concord, New Hampshire, specifically Pierce Mance, the rather comfortable estate where the Pierce family moved in 1842. This is where Pierce heard the news that the war had begun. He was then serving as U.S. Attorney for New Hampshire. He didn't go off to war right away, hoping for an officer's commission in the regular army. As a result, Pierce declined President Polk's offer to serve as his second attorney general. There was another reason why he didn't take that job. In November 1843, he and Jane lost their second son, Frank Robert, in an outbreak of typhus. Even years later, Jane, who suffered from depression, was still mourning his loss. This was the second death of a child that the Pierces had had to endure. He didn't want to make her condition worse by returning to politics, at least not for a while. In early 1847, Congress expanded the U.S. Army to fight the war. A lot of officer positions opened up, and President Polk commissioned Franklin Pierce as a colonel. He was shortly promoted to brigadier general. And at last, he had the chance to follow his father, Benjamin, and his older brother, the guy who looked like Iron Man, into heroic service for his country. Pierce's adventure in Mexico lasted six months to the day. To understand this, we have to backtrack a little. The Mexican-American War, which was mostly about territory, came about largely as the result of the election of Polk as president in 1844, something of a surprise to many people. Polk was an unabashed imperialist. He wanted territory, he wanted gold, and he wanted new states into which he hoped slavery could expand. The annexation of Texas in 1845 was part of this process, but Polk coveted California too. Much of Polk's foreign policy centered around provoking Mexico to strike at Americans so that the U.S. could declare war and plunder it. On June 27, 1847, Brigadier General Franklin Pierce arrived in Veracruz, Mexico, with 2,500 troops and supplies from New England. His mission was to deliver these forces and supplies to General Winfield Scott, the right-hand man of the overall commander, General Zachary Taylor. When Pierce arrived on the coast, Scott was already 150 miles inland with his own army, Pierce took command on this march, and his force fell under attack by Mexicans no less than six times. This was all well and good, but Pierce didn't have much luck for the rest of his time in Mexico. Now having joined up with Scott, he participated in the Battle of Contreras, just outside Mexico City, on August 19, 1847. When the cannons went off, Pierce's horse bolted unexpectedly. Of course, riding a horse... Pierce was on a saddle, and a saddle has one of these. Ouch. The pain from the injury to his balls caused Pierce to pass out. When he fell off his horse, the horse tripped over him and fell on top of him, right on top of his knee, which was badly injured. The battle continued the next day. Pierce hoped to go into action this time. He wisely decided not to ride a horse for the second go-round but he twisted his knee, the same one he had injured the day before. He hobbled the best as he could across the battlefield, but the pain was too intense, and he collapsed again. Word got around that Brigadier General Pierce had fainted twice in battle. Someone said, General Pierce is a damned coward. It didn't get better. The climactic battle of the war was storming the ramparts of Chapultepec in Mexico City. This time, Pierce didn't even make it to the battlefield. He'd caught a stomach bug and was suffering from severe diarrhea. Generals Taylor and Scott stormed the ramparts, captured Mexico City, and basically won the war while Pierce was sitting on the toilet. It could have gone worse for him. I mean, he might have been killed or died of dysentery, 
But between passing out twice, effing up his knee twice, getting knocked in the nuts, and then laid low by Montezuma's revenge, Pierce did not have a good time in Mexico. After hostilities ended and he was able to get off the john, he spent a lot of time drinking. So much for that temperance pledge. Then he requested a leave of absence to return home to New Hampshire. Winfield Scott granted it. Pierce arrived by ship in New Orleans on December 27, 1847, exactly six months after he'd entered the country. Although things had gone badly in Mexico, at least the Americans won, and more importantly, Pierce could say that he served. Just enough had gone right for him for his political supporters to claim that he was a war hero, which of course every politician needs. Back in Concord, Pierce resumed his law practice. He was, as before, officially out of public office, but there was always the possibility and the hope that he could return to politics, even if that wouldn't sit well with Jane. All he had to do was wait for the opportunity. Though his own exploits in Mexico were far from pivotal, the war itself altered the course of American politics and ultimately provided Pierce with his opening. That was the good news for him. The bad news was that the issues stirred up by the war almost always involved slavery. This did not bode well in a republic, now greatly expanded in size, that was teetering on the brink of violent sectionalism. This is a big bowl of fresh cherries, which are in season along the Potomac in the summer months. It might not be entirely fair to say that a bowl of cherries changed the course of American history, but cherries were involved at a critical moment, and you can make an argument that they helped make Franklin Pierce President of the United States. The Mexican-American War ended officially in early 1848, just in time for election season. Polk had pledged not to run again, so the field was wide open. The major issue in 1848 was what to do with all of those vast territories, like California, New Mexico, and so forth, that had been turned over to the United States by Mexico as a result of the treaty that ended the war. Specifically, would they, could they, be turned into slave states or into states where slavery was banned? Polk, who was from Tennessee, and other pro-slavery Southerners hoped that, hell yeah, slavery would spread through these new territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Northerners opposed to slavery were a little miffed about this possibility. Into this powder keg, a Pennsylvania congressman named David Wilmot chucked a live grenade, rhetor rhetorically speaking, a proposal that came to be called the Wilmot Proviso which would have prohibited slavery in any territory gained from Mexico. The proviso did not pass Congress despite numerous attempts, but it certainly shook up the political scene. Going into the 1848 elections, the Whigs were salivating at the prospect of nominating Zachary Taylor, commander of U.S. forces in Mexico, as their candidate. I mean, who wouldn't vote for him? Besides abolitionists, Taylor owned slaves. Taylor was at first apolitical, considering himself an independent, but with some reluctance he eventually admitted that he was more of a Whig than a Democrat, and he allowed himself to be nominated by the Whig party. The party chose as his running mate Millard Fillmore, a career politician from New York State. Taylor officially took no stance on the Wilmot Proviso. He wasn't in favor of it, which pleased pro-slavery Southerners, but he seemed to hint that if it crossed his desk attached to a piece of legislation, that he wouldn't veto it either. The Democrats nominated Lewis Cass, who was also a slave owner. That caused anti-slavery Northerners to bolt the party and form a new party, the Free Soil Party, which nominated former President Martin Van Buren. Yeah, right, let's give Van Ruin another shot at it. That didn't work out too well. Taylor won the election fairly decisively. He was somewhat aloof from the political scene, having a military background, and he distrusted most politicians. As he was taking office, another political bombshell was about to go off. California, where gold had been found in 1848, was swelling in population as a result of the gold rush, and it was about to apply for statehood. Slavery wasn't really a thing in California, 
Since 1820, the time of the Missouri Compromise, slave states and free states had typically been admitted to the Union in pairs to keep uh, slave states and free states evenly balanced in the Senate. California's admission would end this fragile balance. The politicians in Washington, yes, we're back in this room again, swung into action and devised the Compromise of 1850. This was not one measure, but a package of five measures that sought to give slave states and free states something that each of them wanted without necessarily favoring one side over the other. The two most important parts of this compromise were, first, that California would be admitted as a free state, the anti-slavery people liked that, but there would also be a much tougher fugitive slave law, which would have required ordinary citizens, even in states where slavery was banned, to help the authorities track down and catch any runaway slaves that crossed their paths. This particularly enraged people in the North. They wanted nothing to do with slavery, but now the federal government was going to force them to participate in re-enslaving people who had been lucky enough to get away in the first place. As president, Zachary Taylor was opposed to the Compromise of 1850. His opposition doomed its chances of passing. This is where the bowl of cherries comes in. On July 4th, 1850, during an Independence Day celebration on the White House lawn, President Zachary Taylor consumed a large bowl of cherries and a lot of cold milk. Later that day, he came down with indigestion. The doctors called it cholera morbus, which may or may not have been literal cholera, which was a major problem in the swampy environs of Washington, D.C. On July 9th, Zachary Taylor croaked. The new president, Millard Fillmore, indicated that he would support the Compromise of 1850. It passed, and he signed the bill, five bills into law. Democrats, and particularly Franklin Pierce, thought that the Compromise of 1850 was mana from heaven. At last, they thought this was finally the end of the pesky slavery issue. Look, we've got a compromise. That's it. It's over. No more talk about slavery. No more. No more. We're done. In December 1850, at a rally in Concord, New Hampshire, Pierce passionately talked up the compromise. The Union, he screamed, eternal Union. Fortunately for the Democrats, comp the compromise proved problematic for the Whig Party. Now, you have to understand that the major political parties had both northern and southern wings and contained both pro- and anti-slavery people. I mentioned this earlier. Southern Whigs, who were generally pro-slavery, loved the compromise, but northern Whigs hated it. Disarray in the Whig Party meant big gains for Democrats in congressional and state elections in 1850 and 1851. As the next presidential election approached, Southern Whigs enthusiastically supported President Millard Fillmore. You don't hear the words enthusiastic and Millard Fillmore together in the same sentence very often. Meanwhile, Northern Whigs were casting about for a military hero of their own and were gravitating toward Winfield Scott. Voters in 1852 were also increasingly distracted by xenophobic, racist, and anti-immigrant sentiment. Anti-Masons, in particular anti-Catholics, were gaining steam as candidates, especially in northern cities, where lots of Catholic immigrants, most of them from Ireland, had been settling in large numbers since the mid-1840s. The Whig Party at the same time was weakening as a national force. But still, Democrats had problems. They, too, were split between northern and southern wings. Party leaders thought that the best way to unite their own various factions and to appeal to as many voters as possible would be to nominate someone from the north, but with political views sympathetic to slave states as their candidate for president. Now, there were a couple of politicians who could fit this bill, so let's go through them one by one. First up, Lewis Cass, the guy who had lost the 1848 election to Zachary Taylor, he was now sitting in the Senate, and he had the requisite tolerance for slavery and intolerance for Native Americans. He was involved in the whole Trail of Tears thing. But the bad news about him was that, well, he did lose the election, the previous election, pretty handily, so it was already proven that he was not attractive to voters. I mean, come on, would you vote for this guy? 
Next, Levi Woodbury. Remember him? Franklin Pierce read law in his office in Portsmouth before Woodbury got elected to the Senate. In 1851, Woodbury was a Supreme Court justice. Rare for a Supreme Court guy to be a contender for president, but here we are. Number three, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. A career politician, if ever there was one. Very experienced in elective and appointed office, and very shrewd. This was one to watch out for. Probably gay, although that wasn't talked about at the time. He and Pierce, incidentally, detested each other. Four, Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Age 38, he positioned himself as the younger generation's candidate. His fingerprints were all over the Compromise of 1850. But Douglas's real pet project was an idea called popular sovereignty, which would let the people of a territory decide for themselves on a case-by-case basis whether they wanted slavery when it came time to become a state. Now, this idea becomes important later. On September 4th, 1851, Levi Woodbury died of a stomach tumor. That suddenly put Pierce into the mix. He was the next most important senior politician in New Hampshire, but he didn't yet have national stature. The real contest would be a three-way race between Cass, Buchanan, and Douglas. On June 1st, 1852, at the Maryland Institute for the Promotion of the Mechanic Arts, the old center market, which is no longer there, the Democratic National Convention got underway. This was one of those old-time political conventions where they took multiple ballots, completely unknown today. Candidates did not attend uh, conventions personally at this time, so Pierce wasn't there. In fact, he was visiting in Boston with Jane. Party operatives did the wheeling and dealing on the floor of the center market and the hotels and bar rooms of Baltimore. At different times, each of the three frontrunners, Cass, Buchanan, and Douglas, held the lead. But the rules of the convention stated that you needed a two-thirds majority to win. William Marcy of New York was also in the mix. Buchanan, the most shrewd and ruthless of the three, and the one who wanted it the most, was in the strongest position. Two days in, on Friday, Buchanan's delegates, hoping to break the impasse, decided that a couple of their states would switch votes to another candidate on the next ballot, presumably to further dilute the field of candidates opposing Buchanan, which they hoped would show the convention that he was, after all, the strongest candidate. However brilliant an idea they thought this might have been, it backfired. At the next ballot in the morning, Virginia cast 15 votes for Franklin Pierce, the first time his name had appeared on any of the 35 ballots taken up until that time. On the next few ballots, New England states began defecting from Buchanan and Marcy to Pierce. When North Carolina switched to Pierce, the momentum became unstoppable. Buchanan faded, but Marcy, who was still in number one place until the very last vote, could not spin it to his benefit. On the 49th vote, the Democratic delegates cast 282 votes for Franklin Pierce, the dark horse from New Hampshire. When the news reached Boston, it was reported that Jane Pierce actually fainted. She was legitimately shocked. She didn't know he was running for president, or at least didn't know that it was that far along. He deceived her about his plans and ambitions. She hated politics and wished he was out of it, so he couldn't tell her he was running. Most presidents in American history have had the enthusiastic support of their wives. Pierce didn't. This must have made some, for some awkward evenings at home in Concord. You would think that with as contentious as the issues were, that the 1852 presidential campaign would be a grueling all-out slog. Actually, it was a total snooze. About two weeks later, the Whigs had their own disastrous convention which took 52 ballots to nominate Winfield Scott, Pierce's old army commander. Hoping not to frighten away any voters, Scott made no public statement on the Compromise of 1850, but party leaders fostered the impression that he was in favor of it. Southern Whigs, though, refused to support him. As you recall, they liked Fillmore. With Scott's own party divided over him, he had no chance of winning. Officially, there were no policy differences between the candidates, Pierce enthusiastically supported the Compromise of 1850. Scott said nothing about it and was assumed to support it. 
That was really the only issue. Whig supporters tried to make hay of Pierce's embarrassing record in Mexico, contrasting with Scott's war heroism, and they charged that Pierce was a drunk. But Scott was no stranger to bars himself, so that one didn't stick. Pierce did not campaign at all. The results of 1852 look much more decisive than they were. Pierce blew Scott away in the Electoral College, 254 to 42, but he only won the popular vote by less than 250,000 votes out of 3.1 million cast. Voter turnout was record low. Pierce was elected not out of any sense of hope by the American people and without a lot of enthusiasm. For the second to last presidential election before the one that triggered the Civil War, the general apathy about who was going to be president was pretty remarkable and did not bode well for Franklin Pierce. So that brings us back to where we started, January 6, 1853, in Andover, Massachusetts, and the train crash that left 11-year-old Benny Pierce partially decapitated right in front of his parents' eyes. Jane interpreted the tragedy as a divine judgment that God had intervened to remove all obstacles from Franklin Pierce's life so that he could con concentrate on the burdens of his office. The death of their third and last child, in, and in such a grisly and shocking way, couldn't help but cast a dark shadow over Pierce's presidency before it even began. Franklin Pierce's inauguration was held on the east portico of the United States Capitol building on Friday, March 4th, 1853. Jane was not there. She was so devastated by Benny's death that she couldn't even go to his funeral in Concord. She stayed in Andover, where the tragedy had occurred, and she didn't make it to Washington for 18 days after the inauguration. She even refused to take part in the traditional duties of First Lady. She sat in her room at the White House, writing letters addressed to Benny and endlessly rehashing the tragedies of her life. To my untrained eye, these definitely appear to be symptoms of severe depression. To understand what Franklin Pierce did once he was president, you have to understand how the presidency functioned in the mid-19th century. Today, we think of presidents as actually doing something. They want this policy or that one, they have this foreign policy objective or another one, or a program like FDR's New Deal, a specific proposal like Obamacare, or a specific task they're expected to perform like Nixon winding up the Vietnam War or Biden getting the coronavirus under control. Now, it wasn't like this in the mid-19th century, far from it. A president's job in the 1850s was mostly to dole out other jobs, offices, and political appointments. And not just the big stuff like who's going to be Secretary of State. Uh, incidentally, Pierce gave that to William Marcy. But also stuff like who's going to be the collector for the Port of New York, meaning who collects taxes, import duties, which at that time were most of the federal government's revenue. Who will the federal district attorneys be? Whose job will it be to award military or public, public works contracts and administer payrolls and collect tolls and taxes and fees? A 19th century president was basically a glorified HR director, more or less. Now that was about to change, but Pierce didn't know it yet. As a result of this, a president's major decisions uh, during this period and a majority of the work they did was front-loaded. It tended to happen just before and especially just after they entered office, filling a bunch of jobs that had just come open from the last election cycle. In the 1830s, Andrew Jackson instituted the spoils system, where he blitzed federal bureaucracies and restocked them with cronies, toadies, and lackeys. It would take another 50 years before a president, Chester Arthur, started to undo this system. Franklin Pierce was an acolyte of Andrew Jackson, so it was the major work of his administration doling out jobs and political appointments. Pierce, having been a party boss for a long time, was keenly aware that the Democratic Party he headed was an uneasy alliance of factions, many of whom hated each other, 
the way that he, for example, hated James Buchanan. The fact that, the, that his election was relatively easy didn't change this dynamic. He didn't really have a mandate. His overarching goal was to keep the Democratic Party as unified as possible. Not only am I going to repeat that, I'm going to make a graphic out of it because it explains so much of what later happened to him. His goal was to keep the Democratic Party as unified as possible. So, in passing out these jobs, Pierce sought to placate all the factions within the party, not just the ones that supported him, and not just the ones who, like him, held the Compromise of 1850 absolutely sacrosanct, supposedly, and could not be tampered with in any way. He would tamper with it, as we'll see. Democratic leaders in the Senate went ape when it looked like Pierce was going to appoint a free soil guy to his cabinet. That got blocked, but this sort of thing spoiled the relationship between Pierce and congressional Democrats. There was a dizzying array of factions within the party. I won't go into them all, or really any of them, uh, beyond the major ones that we've already talked about. But just to give you an example, there was within New York State alone a group called the Hard Shell Democrats and another one called the Soft Shell Democrats, each with their own constituencies and power bases. Pierce's main objective when he got into office was to placate all of these groups. Not only did it not work, it backfired badly. Pierce's attempts to unify the party had the effect of alienating most of the central faction that he could otherwise have counted on to support him, the centrist Northern Democrats who strongly supported the Compromise of 1850. For the first couple of months of his term, Congress wasn't in session. It typically didn't meet until December of the year after it was elected. So what this meant is that congressmen and senators elected at the same time as Pierce was elected in November 1852 wouldn't convene for another 13 months until December 1853. Pierce had a free hand to deal with foreign affairs during that interval. The two biggest foreign policy problems in the early 1850s were the traditional ones, Great Britain and Spain. Pierce appointed James Buchanan, his rival at the 1852 convention, as ambassador to Great Britain. But Buchanan insisted on being a prima donna about it, first dithering on whether to take the job at all, then insisting on certain conditions about certain issues that he was going to work on. He did eventually go to London, but the professional relationship between him and Pierce was strained. Not surprising. As for Spain, the real issue there was that the United States wanted Cuba, then a Spanish colony. Southerners wanted it as an additional slave state, and they were afraid that if a slave revolt broke out on the island of Cuba, it would spread to the southern U.S. Exactly what Pierce was going to do about Cuba went back and forth. Eventually, several U.S. diplomats in Europe, including Buchanan, drafted a document called the Ostend Manifesto that said that the United States should buy Cuba or try to buy Cuba for $100 million. And if Spain wouldn't sell, then they were going to take it by force. Leaks about the contents of this document stirred up controversy, and the embarrassing press coverage forced Pierce to publish its contents in the fall of 1854. When that happened, northern states were outraged. Spain was outraged. Britain was outraged. The Ostend Manifesto severely damaged the Pierce administration's credibility on foreign policy. Nice work, James Buchanan. But by far, the biggest bomb to explode in Pierce's face was the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Pierce's desire to unite the Democratic Party as much as possible and the naked ambition of Stephen Douglas caused Pierce to walk right into this trap. In December 1853, as Congress was finally assembling, Douglas received a letter from a Missouri politician who warned him that the party was on the brink of fracturing unless the Pierce administration did something, took some action that would have the effect of uniting the party in favor of some bold policy, and especially uniting the Whigs in opposition against it. Douglas agreed with this warning, but he also saw an angle in it for him personally and politically. Remember I said that his idea, his pet idea, was popular sovereignty. The notion that a territory, when it was about to apply for statehood, could decide for itself 
whether or not to allow slavery. The next territory that was starting to coalesce at this time and would be ready for statehood soon was Nebraska Territory to the west of slave-owning Missouri. Douglas thought that he could get popular sovereignty enshrined into a law that would recognize this territory, most likely splitting it into two potential states. Kansas, where they most people thought slavery would probably be allowed, and Nebraska, the northern part where it probably wouldn't. However, to pull this off, Douglas would need to repeal the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had prohibited slavery north of a line extending from the southern border of Missouri, except for Missouri itself. Now, this would be hugely controversial, and it would tamper with the untamperable Compromise of 1850. And Douglas thought in his crafty game of nine-dimensional chess that it would royally piss off the Whigs. This was the key point, that it would enrage Democrats, Democrats' opponents. This could be the bold action that the Pierce administration could get behind in order to unite Democrats. And it would buff up Douglas's national credentials for another run at the presidency. In January 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act took shape. Not surprisingly, because this was the whole point, Douglas decided that in order to get over the top in Congress, the bill needed the public support of the president, Franklin Pierce. On Sunday, January 22, 1854, a meeting took place at the White House at the suggestion of Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War and a close friend of Franklin Pierce. Stephen Douglas was there, and so were several Democratic lawmakers, mostly from southern states. Now, we don't know what was said at this meeting. There are no notes uh, from it that have survived. However, historians have inferred that the congressmen and senators, particularly uh, Stephen Douglas, sold President Pierce on supporting the Kansas-Nebraska Act as a means to unite the Democratic Party against the inevitable outrage by Whigs, both the northern ones, who tended to sympathize with abolitionists, and the southern ones, who would be pissed that Pierce had tampered with the sacrosanct Compromise of 1850. Given the bad blood that Pierce had created by the mess he made of doling out those patronage jobs, Pierce had an incentive to try to make up for that blunder. Douglas essentially led him into a trap. If this is what happened at that meeting, remember, we can't be sure, but it seems plausible, then Franklin Pierce's natural tendency to try to please everybody caused him to make the single worst decision of his presidency. He said he would support the act. Bad call, Ripley. After a bunch of political wrangling, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in May of 1854. Franklin Pierce signed it on May 30th. It did not have the effect anybody intended. In fact, it blew both parties and the country to smithereens. I'll talk about that in Chapter 9, so hold that thought. At this point, though, it's worth asking, what actually went right for Franklin Pierce as president? That's in the next chapter. This desolate landscape, located near Yuma, Arizona, is what passes for a success of the Franklin Pierce administration. Indeed, you have to dig so deep to find something positive from his four years in office that this is basically where you end up. And even this quote-unquote success is tainted with the dark shadow of slavery. This location is on a patch of territory that came to be known as the Gadsden Purchase. James Gadsden, he has nothing whatsoever to do with the fake flag beloved by QAnon cultists. Anyway, Gadsden was ambassador to Mexico, appointed by Pierce in May 1853. The United States had taken a large swathe of territory from Mexico in the war, but this one little piece, kind of like a missing Lego brick, was astride the route that various people thought would be the most advantageous for where a transcontinental railroad might one day be constructed. The terrain just to the north of here was judged too mountainous. One of the people who pressed for American acquisition of this particular piece of territory was Pierce's Secretary of War and friend Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy. His idea was to build a railroad across the U.S. in the South, not the North, to benefit slaveholding interests. 
Had it been built, it probably would have been built with slave labor. Gadsden, on Pierce's orders, succeeded in buying the last Lego brick from the Mexican government. Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the military dictator of Mexico, really didn't want to sell it. But he figured that if he didn't, the U.S. would probably just take the territory by force, and Mexico needed the money anyway. Pierce was not happy with the final treaty, which he thought went too far in the government protecting and essentially subsidizing private and corporate interests, but the Senate ratified the treaty anyway. The Southern Route Transcontinental Railroad was never built, so the essential purpose of the Gadsden Purchase was ultimately frustrated. The purchase also dispossessed a number of Native American nations of their ancestral lands, so if this counts as a success of Pierce's administration, it's tainted both by slavery and injustice to Native Americans. But 130 years later, part of Return of the Jedi was eventually filmed near here, so there's that, I guess. Even setting Cuba aside, Pierce's record on foreign policy was pretty dismal. In 1853, a war broke out between several powers of Europe. Though a minor conflict by European standards, the Crimean War, principally between Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire on one side and Russia on the other, did have repercussions for the United States. Various British agents sought to recruit their Crimean-bound armies from among Americans. Pierce complained and even expelled three British consuls from the U.S. for having done this. This matter complicated the negotiations going on with Britain over the Central America stuff. Then there were the filibusters. Now, most of us think a filibuster is when a legislator, often a senator, blocks a bill on the floor of the legislature, usually by talking for hours on end, like Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. But in the 19th century, the word filibuster meant something different. It referred to a person, usually some unscrupulous businessman or mercenary, who took it upon himself to invade foreign territory and set himself up as the ruler of it, in the hopes that the American government would back him in order to acquire that territory. Take one William Walker, a former doctor and newspaper publisher, but also a notorious dueler, mercenary, and wannabe dictator. In 1855, Walker went to Nicaragua with a force of 60 men, most of them Southerners. He had already unsuccessfully tried to filibuster Baja California a few years earlier. Nicaragua was attractive, because first because it was thought at that time to be the most likely route of a canal that would make it easier to sail from the Atlantic to Pacific Oceans, and second because Nicaragua could potentially be a new slave state. Walker eventually took over the government of Nicaragua. Stupidly, Pierce recognized his regime as the legitimate government of the country. Costa Rica, Nicaragua's neighbor, would have none of it and invaded. Walker fought ferociously and even engaged in biological warfare by poisoning water wells in enemy territory with the bodies of cholera victims. Real nice guy. Walker was run out of the country and eventually wound up getting captured by the government of Honduras, where he faced a firing squad in 1860. Pierce suffered withering criticism for having backed him. Pierce's personal life was not going much better than his administration. After a long period of mourning for Benny, Jane finally began to come online as First Lady, having delegated in the interim most of the duties of White House hostess to her aunt, Abby Kent Means. Jane began attending a few spotty receptions and dinners beginning in 1855. She never gave up her obsession with Benny and even once tried to contact his spirit through a seance. Relations between Jane and her husband were strained. Pierce acted pious and religious in his wife's presence, but often turned to drinking when she was away. He hated abolitionists. Jane was increasingly attracted by the movement. And she never stopped hoping that his political career would be derailed somehow. As it turned out, she would not have long to wait. The fracturing of America over slavery was greatly increasing during Pierce's term. In the summer of 1852, as he was running for president, a novel written by the wife of Pierce's Bowdoin College classmate Calvin Ellis Stowe had become a national sensation. That novel was Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
the best-selling book of the 19th century in America after the Bible. Uncle Tom's Cabin, which grew even more popular as the 1850s wore on, depicted slavery in harsh and uncompromising terms. Despite the book's problems, such as perpetuating harmful stereotypes of African Americans, it did greatly aid the abolitionist cause and enraged pro-slavery Southerners. Attitudes over slavery were sharpening everywhere. Previously, in American society, people could disagree about slavery more or less respectfully, however strongly uh, they held their private views. But by the 1850s, the difference of opinion had begun to color everything, almost every facet of national politics and public life. People like Pierce, who generally blamed abolitionists for this discord, were weary and exasperated by the increasing visibility and ubiquity of disagreements over the slavery issue. He and others like him simply couldn't understand why people just couldn't shut up about slavery and treat it as a non-issue. The Compromise of 1850 had permanently solved the slavery issue, he thought. Clearly, it hadn't. And trying to hurry up and forget about slavery as a national issue proved ultimately completely unworkable, unrealistic, and in fact, dangerous. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was a bomb that blew up in everybody's face, especially Franklin Pierce's. It had none of the effects that its architects intended, and its unintended consequences were disastrous. Indeed, this law, which President Pierce signed on May 30th, 1854, was possibly the single worst piece of national legislation in America of the 19th century. It didn't cause the Civil War, but it certainly hastened it. If you recall, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was supposedly a masterstroke of nine-dimensional chess being played by Stephen Douglas of Illinois, who hoped to save the badly fractured Democratic Party by using the act to unite ferocious Whig Party resistance against it and against the Pierce administration. The act didn't do that. To explain just how it went so wrong, let me show you another animation. To the right is the Democratic Party, split into two groups, Northern Democrats, who were generally not pro-slavery, and Southern Democrats, who generally were. To the left is Whigs, also split into Northern and Southern factions. The key to Douglas's nine-dimensional chess game was this group, the Southern Whigs. They were the ones who were most happy with the idea of the Compromise of 1850 having settled the issue of slavery for all time, and Douglas thought that these people would oppose anything that tended to disturb that fragile equilibrium. Northern Whigs were going to oppose the Kansas-Nebraska Act no matter what because they thought it advanced slaveholding interests. But if Southern Whigs opposed it because they were pissed that the Compromise had been disturbed, this would unite Whig opposition, which would cause Democrats to unite behind President Pierce's policy of supporting the bill. That's not what happened, however. The perception that the Kansas-Nebraska Act was a frontal assault on anti-slavery Northerners and a box of luscious treats for Southerners who wanted to expand slavery inflamed those Northern Whigs who opposed slavery. In the late winter and spring of 1854, even before the act passed, newspaper editorials were full of denunciations of the act on the grounds that it would advance slavery and slaveholding power. This group, the Southern Whigs, were pissed, but they were pissed at what they saw as unfair propaganda by radical abolitionists, talking crap about the Kansas-Nebraska Act and advancing the interests of abolitionists, whom the Southern Whigs hated. Therefore, because they hated abolitionists and wanted to stick it to them, Southern Whigs thought it would be better to support the Kansas-Nebraska Act on the theory that it would piss off those people who they didn't like, and you thought negative partisanship was a modern phenomenon. So what this meant is that this group, Southern Whigs, joined pro-slavery Democrats in supporting the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It also meant that this group, Northern anti-slavery Democrats, broke ranks with their own party and their own president to oppose the act, which Northern Whigs also did. 
Yeah. We know all of this because of the voting records in Congress when the act finally passed. Douglas had put up the act to provoke a partisan fight that would unite both parties, but especially his. What it actually did was splinter both parties, which now began to reorganize not on a political basis, but a regional one. Good job, Stephen Douglas. Proof positive that this thing went sideways? The congressional elections of 1854 were an utter bloodbath for Democrats. They lost seats in state after state, especially the North, even in New Hampshire, Pierce's home state. But unlike our own time, when partisan contests are generally a zero-sum game in which one side's misfortune is always, always inures to the benefit of the other, the Whigs also came unglued in 1854. Most of the gains that were to be had were among the small, temporary, or single-issue parties, like the Know-Nothings, which had rebranded themselves as the American Party, or the Free Soil Party. The consequences on the ground were much worse than what was happening in Congress or at the ballot box. Pretty much before the ink had dried on the Kansas-Nebraska Act, people on both sides of the slavery question started loading up their wagons and heading for the territory. Pro-slavery people who lived just across the line in Missouri got there first. They wanted to be sure that when Kansas was organized as a state, there would be a majority of pro-slavery voters and thus, Kansas would come into the Union as a slave state. Anti-slavery Northerners, who generally had farther to travel, wanted to get there to avoid this. Therefore, we have the unique spectacle in American history of people actually wanting to go to Kansas. Boomtowns like Atchison and Leavenworth sprang up overnight. Knowing there would be a political contest, these people tended to bring guns with them, and they weren't at all afraid to use them. As for who the legitimate residents of Kansas were who should be able to vote for the territorial legislature and eventually a state constitution, forget it. Nobody could tell. Between settlers, both temporary and permanent, who came, and fraudulent ballots in territorial elections, determining whether Kansas really wanted to be a free state or a slave state was pretty much impossible. Hmm, Stephen Douglas didn't seem to think of this. Pierce, as usual, had made things worse by appointing as interim territorial governor a guy named Andrew Reeder of Pennsylvania, who was less interested in organizing the new state of Kansas than he was in getting rich on land speculation. Reeder refused to rubber stamp the results of the elections for the territorial legislature, which took place on March 30th, 1855, and were heavily spoiled by pro-slavery Missouri carpetbaggers, and also by outright fake votes. Pierce, who had hoped that the election would result in a comfortably pro-slavery legislature in Kansas, was enraged and fired Reeder, but the damage was done. Eventually, there were two rival governments in Kansas, one pro-slavery, the other anti, each claiming to be the legitimate government of Kansas. Pierce stubbornly continued to recognize the pro-slavery government, despite plenty of evidence that the elections that had brought it to power were fixed. Violence broke out in Kansas in November 1855, first in a feud between settlers, which apparently didn't involve politics, but the reaction to it by the authorities and the locals flared it into a low-level guerrilla war that started to smolder all throughout the countryside. People got shot, settlements were sacked and burned. Ironically, the political fracas over slavery had the effect of impeding the actual spread of slavery into Kansas. Historians estimate that there were only about 200 enslaved people in all of Kansas territory in the late 1850s. The political opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act coalesced quickly. In March 1854, in northern states, particularly Wisconsin and states of New England, northern Whigs and free soil men started to meet in front parlors and taverns to talk up a new political party which would oppose the spread of slavery, especially in Kansas territory. By the summer, this new party had a name, the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. 
while explicitly not pledged to abolitionism, that would have been a political non-starter, the Republicans wanted to keep slavery out of all new territories, both the ones that the U.S. already had and any that they, uh, that they might uh, acquire thereafter. This was in direct opposition to the plans of many pro-slavery Southerners, who, as you recall, wanted Cuba and possibly Nicaragua as future slave states. The Republicans organized too late in the election cycle to have much impact on the congressional elections of 1854 and 1855. However, leaders such as Salmon Chase and Preston Blair were keen on getting the party organized in time for the next presidential election, approaching as inexorably as another mediocre season of The Simpsons. In the meantime, Franklin Pierce grew increasingly out of touch with political reality. He largely ignored the chicanery in Kansas and steadfastly supported the pro-slavery elements there. He insisted that the Kansas-Nebraska Act was administration policy and that all Democrats should unite behind it, despite the fact that it had splintered his party. He even looked forward confidently to the 1856 election, despite all signs pointing to the conclusion that voters were running away from Franklin Pierce faster than if he'd been dipped in poo. You can imagine that Pierce drank a lot during this period. Then in May 1856 came the coup de grace to Franklin Pierce's political career. That's in the next chapter. By 1856, no president had been elected to a second term in 24 years. One had been defeated, one died, one was literally drummed out of his party, one pledged to serve only one term, and in any event died three months into what would have been his second term if he had served one. Another one died. The one after that didn't get the nomination. Yet by some accounts in the fall of 1855, Franklin Pierce really thought he'd get the Democratic nomination, and he seemed to think there was a good chance that he would win the election that next fall. In reality, by the spring of 1856, the universe of beings who did like Franklin Pierce had shrunk down to his dog, he had a Japanese chin, a gift of Commodore Perry, and some newspaper editors and Democratic leaders in the Deep South, who got tingles in their pants from Pierce's friendliness to slavery. So he did have some supporters, to be fair. But it seems strange, as shrewd as he was at politics for most of his career, that he didn't appreciate just how uphill a second-term battle was going to be. All of that ended after one disastrous week in May. Franklin Pierce's week from hell began on Monday, May 19, 1856, in this room, the old Senate chamber in the U.S. Capitol. Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, an abolitionist, former Whig and Free Soil Democrat who had converted to the Republican Party almost as soon as it was formed, stood up and gave a speech which was to last for two days. That speech, called The Crime Against Kansas, was a howl of rage against slavery, the slave power, and particularly the state of South Carolina, the slaviest of all slave states. Sumner attacked one of South Carolina's senators, Andrew Butler, by name, accusing him of cavorting with a harlot, which was the institution of slavery. Sumner also slammed Stephen Douglas, calling him the squire of slavery and insulting his Kansas-Nebraska act as a swindle. The speech was pretty shocking compared to the gentleman's club atmosphere that was usually maintained in the Senate. A congressman from South Carolina, Preston Brooks, a distant cousin of Andrew Butler, was so hot and bothered by the speech and especially the sexualized language against, used against his cousin that he determined to challenge Sumner to a duel. However, according to the arcane code of honor among South Carolina gentlemen, a duel was only permissible between men of roughly equal social standing, which Brooks did not consider Sumner to be. So instead, he just decided to beat the crap out of him. On Thursday, May 22nd, Brooks walked into the Senate chamber, which was nearly deserted except for Sumner and a couple of others. He walked right up to Sumner's desk, took out his walking stick, and beat him within an inch of his life. Brooks broke his cane over Sumner's head, and even the Senate desk got ripped out of the floor. 
Sumner suffered what we would today diagnose as a traumatic brain injury. Brooks walked out of the chamber and was promptly fated across the South as a hero. Admirers sent him new canes to replace the one that he broke over Sumner's head. The day of the beating, newspapers across the country, at least the Republican ones, were full of hyperbole of something that had happened in Kansas the day before, Wednesday, May 21st. The sheriff of Douglas County, Kansas, gathered a posse of 800 people, mostly pro-slavery settlers from the South, to march on the settlement of Lawrence, which had been founded by anti-slavery people. The objective was to shut down some abolitionist newspapers operating from that uh, settlement and also to sack a hotel in Lawrence, which the pro-slavery people thought could be used as some sort of military fort. One person was killed in the Sack of Lawrence, as it was called, but the newspapers played it up as a massacre with multiple casualties. It was the latest example of violence in Kansas over the issue of slavery. One anti-slavery man in Kansas was especially disturbed by the Sack of Lawrence. John Brown, a fanatical abolitionist from Massachusetts who had gone to Kansas with his sons, now adults, was determined to get revenge. He was also angered by the news which reached Kansas that weekend about the beating of Charles Sumner in the Senate. On Saturday night, May 24th, Brown and four of his sons set out armed with broadswords. They invaded three separate homes of pro-slavery Kansas settlers and killed them with swords in a scene so messy it was like something out of a Dario Argento film. The Potawatomi Massacre became infamous in newspapers throughout the country, which were now throwing dueling articles and editorials at each other about how bad the tensions over slavery had become. To be sure, Franklin Pierce had nothing to do with these two events personally. But coming as they did, so close in time, and barely more than a week before the Democratic National Convention in Cincinnati, they basically slammed the final nails in Pierce's political coffin. At the end of May, just after the Potawatomi Massacre and just before the convention, enraged anti-slavery Northerners burned Franklin Pierce in effigy, together with a mannequin representing Preston Brooks in Pierce's hometown of Concord, New Hampshire. When the convention opened, most political observers thought that James Buchanan, Pierce's old nemesis from 1852, was well-positioned to get the nomination. Surprisingly, Buchanan was thought to be more electable because he'd been out of the country during the whole Kansas-Nebraska thing. As you recall, he was in London, accomplishing remarkably little in terms of enduring diplomatic achievements. Kansas-Nebraska didn't have his fingerprints on it. But on the first ballot in Cincinnati, Buchanan got 135 votes and Pierce 122, with Stephen Douglas running third. Under the rules, though, as in 1852, you had to have two-thirds to win, so they dueled for several more ballots. Douglas, consistently in third place, was the spoiler. The winner needed 177 votes out of 296 to claim the nomination. By the 14th ballot, Buchanan had 152 and a half, not sure you can have half of a delegate, but anyway, and Pierce had 75. If Douglas released his delegates to Buchanan, that would put Buchanan over the top. But Douglas Douglas was angling for something, maybe the vice presidential nod. He was sure as hell not going to support Pierce, but he did stand in the way of Buchanan's nomination. On the fourth day of the convention, Buchanan threw Douglas a bone. He, Buchanan, told Douglas that if he stood down this time, Buchanan would pledge not to run for a second term in 1860. That would clear the way for Douglas to be the Democratic nominee. Douglas agreed. He withdrew his name from from contention. On the 16th ballot, Franklin Pierce, sitting president of the United States, received zero votes from delegates of his own party for the nomination. On the 17th ballot, everybody voted for Buchanan. Pierce's private reaction to his political failure isn't recorded. Publicly, he pledged to support Buchanan, the Democratic nominee, and he confidently predicted a Democratic landslide in the fall. He gave a speech to this effect from a White House window. 
I would love to have been a fly on the wall at the White House that day. I can easily imagine Pierce, after giving his speech, quietly closing the window, drawing the curtains, and reaching for a bottle of booze. Between the time that he lost the Democratic nomination in 1856 and the day that he and Jane left the White House for good, Franklin Pierce was President of the United States for 271 more days. It's hard to imagine the loneliness and melancholy of those days. Pierce's administration was effectively over. His name had been dragged through the mud, his political legacy was non-existent, his wife was distant, depressed, physically ill, and completely unsupportive. His country was on the verge of civil war. Perhaps worst of all, all of his children were dead. The Democrats, now led by his enemy, James Buchanan, did win the election that year. But Republicans, who were entering their very first presidential election cycle, did surprisingly well. They nominated Army General and Western Trailblazer John C. Fremont, and received about a third of the national popular vote. Buchanan got only 45%, with the rest going to know-nothing candidate Millard Fillmore. Buchanan's base of support was the pro-slavery South, which was kind of ominous for a candidate from Pennsylvania, known as the Sage of Wheatland. But at last, Buchanan, the most craven, sociopathic, cutthroat politician in America, had succeeded in his all-consuming 35-year quest to become president. A fat lot of good it would end up doing him in the end. Buchanan's victory didn't lighten Pierce's mood very much. On December 2nd, 1856, he sent his annual message to Congress for the last time. This is today known as the State of the Union. In the, in the mid-19th century, it was written and submitted as a document and not given as a speech. This document really stands out when compared to other presidents' State of the Union messages. Most of it was a geyser of vitriol against abolitionists, and the Republican Party in particular, which Pierce charged directly with undermining the Union, subverting the Constitution, indoctrinating the people of the United States with dangerous ideas, and agitating for civil war. Pierce blamed the whole Kansas thing on anti-slavery Northerners. He claimed he had no power to intervene in Kansas's crooked elections, and bizarrely asserted that Kansas was now peaceful thanks to him when exactly the opposite was true. Was he drunk when he wrote the message? We'll never know, but it definitely does not burnish his historical reputation. As the Pierces prepared to move out of the White House in early March 1857, Jane was not well. She suffered from tuberculosis, called consumption in the 19th century, and a new bout struck just as their clock was running out. For his part, incoming President Buchanan wasn't well either. He and several others had caught food poisoning at a banquet at the National Hotel in Washington back in January, a disease bad enough to have killed several people in Buchanan's party. Incredibly, he went back to the National Hotel on March 3rd, the night before the inauguration, and got food poisoning again. He almost wasn't well enough to give his inaugural address the next morning, but he managed to not crap his pants long enough to get through the speech. At the time of his inauguration, Buchanan knew the results of a Supreme Court case that was about to be released two days later, and which he confidently predicted would finally, finally settle the slavery question in America once and for all. That case was Dred Scott v. Sanford which, much to Buchanan's surprise, not only did not settle the slavery question, but drove the U.S. even farther towards civil war than Franklin Pierce already had. Pierce and Buchanan hated each other, but they shared the delusion that the way to deal with the slavery issue was simply to stop talking about the slavery issue. The Pierces stayed three weeks in Washington after the inauguration to allow Jane's condition to improve. They took a long, leisurely route back to New Hampshire, perhaps reluctant to return to the home that they had left four years ago just after Benny's tragic death. There were no children left alive to welcome them back, and most of Pierce's own neighbors despised him for political reasons. He drank, 
They didn't stay in New Hampshire long and indeed left for Europe in December 1857. While in Europe, specifically Rome, Pierce caught up with his old friend Nathaniel Hawthorne, who remarked on the former president's mood, writing, quote, Pierce has undergone so great a sorrow of his own. Pierce and his wife did not return to the United States until September 1859. They left the country again, though, within a few more months, this time sailing for the Bahamas. There's a curious sense of detachment evident in Pierce's later years. He kept in touch with friends and political allies, including Jefferson Davis, but his main preoccupation was being his wife's primary caregiver. Political events spun out of Buchanan's control just as they had Pierce's. For a man so gifted with talents and experience, Buchanan utterly failed the country as the secession crisis gained steam following the election of Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, as president in 1860, something pro-slavery Southerners simply could not tolerate. Buchanan didn't lift a finger to stop secession. In fact, he spent most of his time and effort in his last few months in office explaining why he thought he couldn't do anything. Pierce, of course, was out of politics, so he didn't have to go on record. In the spring of 1861, he made some tepid suggestions on proposed last-minute compromises to preserve the Union, and he might have attended a peace convention in Washington if illness hadn't intervened. Pierce steadfastly blamed the Civil War on Republicans and abolitionists. It was all their fault. The, their radical idea that slavery was a violation of human rights was, to him, unconscionable. During the war, Pierce kept stepping in poo pretty much every time he opened his mouth, and even sometimes when he didn't. On the 4th of July, 1863, he gave a speech slamming Lincoln for prosecuting outspoken opponents of his war policy. Pierce denounced the war as fruitless. This was one day after the Union victory at Gettysburg and on the same day as Grant's victory at Vicksburg. The newspapers, at least in the North, pilloried him. On another occasion, his private correspondence with Jefferson Davis, now Confederate president, was published in Northern papers, making Pierce look even more like a friend of traitors. Then, in December 1863, Jane finally died of tuberculosis. This was not unexpected, to be sure, but his grief consumed him. As if this wasn't bad enough, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who by this time had returned to the United States, got sick. Pierce brought his friend to New Hampshire. They were on a trip to Plymouth, staying at a hotel in adjoining rooms. On the morning of May 19, 1864, Pierce woke up, looked in on his friend, and found him dead in his bed. Franklin Pierce was now truly alone. Kids, dead. Wife, dead. Best friend, dead. And Pierce himself had discovered the corpse. He lived at a rented house in Concord and a cottage on the New, Eng New Hampshire coast. Members of the Hawthorne family occasionally visited him. He drank heavily. In September 1867, a nephew went to look in on him and found the former president alone in his shore cottage, dreadfully sick from drunkenness. Two years later, in September 1869, a weak, ailing former President Franklin Pierce returned to his house in Concord. It was located here on Main Street, where that vacant lot is. The house burnt down in 1981, and nothing has been built there since. Here is a picture of it earlier in the 20th century. By now, Pierce was suffering from cirrhosis of the liver, and he knew he was dying. He told a doctor that he didn't expect to live much longer. He hired a hospice worker, a young Irish lady, to look after him. No member of his family was with him. On October 7, 1869, Pierce fell unconscious. He died later that night. Alcohol-related disease was undoubtedly the cause of his death. It's hard to know how to judge Franklin Pierce. He was a man who should have been a sterling leader who had all the stuff to be one of the truly great presidents. Stainless steel revolutionary family background. The best education that money could buy in America at that time. Well positioned politically. Good looks, charm, bravery, his foibles in Mexico notwithstanding. 
But Pierce was also a man fundamentally incapable of understanding the true nature of slavery and what it was doing to the United States. And the almost unimaginable tragedies of his personal life certainly didn't help. In a way, you can't blame Franklin Pierce. He was from a generation fundamentally unsuited for political leadership under the circumstances in which the American Republic found itself between 1836 and 1861. He was a party politician, a hack, in a generation of party hacks to whom leadership devolved after the revolutionary generation died off. Given the other party hacks of the same period, Van Buren, Tyler, Fillmore, Buchanan, all of whom failed almost as spectacularly as Pierce did, you could make the argument that no one could have led the country competently through those challenging times. Then again, someone finally did surface who was up to the task, and he was from the same generation. Lincoln was born in 1809, only five years after Pierce. In 2005, I wrote a short story called President in the Bathroom, which I guess you could call fantasy or magical realism. In this story, which is set in the modern day, an overworked lawyer who stressed that his job confesses to his wife that he's been seeing and talking to a spectral presence who appears to him every morning in the bathroom, and that presence is inexplicably Franklin Pierce. I published the story on Amazon Kindle several years ago, bundled together with another story called The Stranger of Mount Vernon. Uh, this collection is absolutely free. If you're interested in getting it, the link to it is in the description. If you liked this video, please hit the various buttons, subscribe, the thumb, the bell, all of the stuff that you normally do for a video you like. I've got much more where this came from on my channel, long-form videos dealing with nautical and ship history, debunking conspiracy theories, even historical analyses of popular movies. So check those out if you're interested. And thank you all again for joining me on this journey into the past. Thank you.